so um, it's been a few weeks since I recorded with Happenstance. Um, sorry about the hat, by the way. I'll explain that later. Uh, about, uh, I guess it was a week or so, a week and a half after I last filmed um, on, on a Tuesday, I got a phone call from my my diabetes doctor or my endocrinologist. Um, the Monday before that Tuesday, so the day before, um, I had had blood work drawn for a routine appointment that I had coming up that week. Um, so like I said, Tuesday, I get a phone call early in the morning. Um, started with my grandmother, my endocrinologist, and my mom. They were all trying to get a hold of me. Um, I didn't get the first few few, uh, few phone calls because we were uh, we were busy doing something else. Um, when I was finally able to check the voicemail, um, my grandmother was actually calling me. So I answered the phone, and she's all in a frantic and telling me that I needed to get need to get to the emergency room as soon as possible. So she wasn't exactly sure why. Um, and I hung up with her and called my endocrinologist back. Um, they had gotten preliminary results back from my blood work already, which I thought it took longer than a day, but apparently not. <laughs> um, they needed me to get to the ER because my potassium levels were high, very high, um, 6.4 um, when they pulled them on Monday. So they wanted me to go to the hospital, have them checked again, and go from there. Um, got to the ER, they explained to me the potassium levels can be triggered by any number of things. Um, sometimes things that you eat, you know, things like that. Um, could even be a bad stick where the blood takes too long to draw from the arm into the vial and it, coag it coagulates or whatever it does in the, in the, the vial. Um, so they they pulled pulled a couple of vials. Um, took about an hour and a half, two hours to get the results back. But I got the results back. Sure enough, my potassium was still high. It dropped a little bit, but it was still high. Um, they had a treatment for that. And they were gonna, you know, I'd be sent home, and I'd have to take this liquid stuff. Um, but at the same time finding out my potassium levels were definitely high. I also found out that my creatinine level was 3.1. Um, creatinine is a number that doctors use to determine your kidney function. Um, typically, um, in a transplant patient, which I've been transplanted before, um, nine years ago, uh, it would be nine years in August. Um, When you're transplanted, they typically want your creatinine levels to be, be between 0 0.08, or I'm sorry, 0.8, and like 1.1, 1.2. And I had held steady at 1.1 for about years. Um, so when I got, they told me the number was 3.1. It had been slowly creeping up for about a year or so. Um, back in March of 2015, um, I had went for a routine checkup with my, my nephrologist or my kidney doctor, and I had noticed rapid weight gain. No, I didn't realize how much weight I had gained. And at that point, my doctor didn't tell me, but when he listened to my lungs, he could hear a lot of fluid. Um, so he put me on a, a high dose of Lasix, and that day I weighed in at 242 pounds. Within three days, I had dropped roughly 20, 20 to 25 pounds of water. I had gotten down to about two, uh, 215 in three days. Um, I went back to see him two weeks later and my lungs were cleared up and that was when he had told me how much, how much fluid he had noticed in my lungs. Um, but on, on 
that two week checkup. Um, he was very pleased with the progress and how things had changed. My lungs were back to sounding normal. Um, I've always had pretty healthy lungs. <laughs> um, something that actually works. Um, so, coming back to the present, um, emergency room doctor told me my creatinine was 3.1 and I knew what that meant. Um, it just, I knew that it meant my kidneys were failing, or my kidney. Um, I just didn't know how much function I had left. Um, I know when I went on, the last time I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, I was at like 5.4 with creatinine, and I had like 15% when I was diagnosed end-stage renal disease. Um, so I was going to have to wait three days till Friday, till that Friday, to uh, to see my nephrologist or my my kidney doctor. Um, so I went to see him. He had all my blood work already, and it um, you know he he, he just confirmed it. It was everything was high. Um, everything that wasn't supposed to be high was high. Everything that wasn't supposed to be low was low. It was just everything was just out of whack. Um, he didn't say for sure what my kidney function was at, um, but he did tell me that by the end of the summer, no later than the end of the year, I will be back on dialysis. Um, I'm lucky in the fact that I've never had any abdominal surgeries prior to my last dialysis. Um, I choose to do a type of dialysis where I don't go to a clinic. I do it at home. Um, I hook up every night. Um, I'm not currently set up to do it, but um, within a few months I will be. Um, basically, they insert a catheter into my stomach, um, hangs out. Um, it's great for party tricks. Um, and I'll hook up to a machine every night. It'll, it'll inject fluid into me that mixes with the toxins, and then the machine draws it back out. It does this four or five times a night. Um, but I do it every night. Um, you maintain most of your energy opposed to like a hemodialysis where you go to a, clean, a clinic and they draw your blood, filter it, and put it back through and it's like they drain like all your blood. <laughs> it's, I mean, not to sound dramatic or you know anything like that, but it's basically they filter all your blood and inject it back into you. Um, I have to go see a vascular surgeon um, within the next few weeks. I have to have a, uh, I have to have vascular mapping done on my arms. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but in this arm, um, I have a scar right here. This is from the last time I was on dialysis. Even though I didn't do hemodialysis, I still have to have what's called an AV fistula. Um, just in case of an emergency, if my if my catheter should fail or anything like that, um, the reason they do the AV fistula so soon is because it takes months to heal. It takes months to be ready. Um, it actually is kind of cool because if you sleep on your arm at night, you can feel it and hear it vibrating. It's kind of neat. Um, you can also feel it to the touch. Um, where the catheter, it takes roughly about two weeks to to uh, to heal and be ready for use. Um, I will be going back on the on the transplant list, um, but first, I'm currently sitting at 205 pounds. Um, I'm five foot five. Yeah, I built like a fire plug. Um, up until I was transplanted last time, I was 100, 172 pounds. I think I topped out at. It was the heaviest I was ever at. And then I was transplanted, went in the transplant at 172 pounds, came out at 192 pounds because of all the fluid they used during the, during the procedure. Um, was able to get a lot of that off, but between my, my insulin regimens and the anti-rejection drugs and everything like that, I just I couldn't keep the weight off. Um, add to that 
the fact that I'm visually impaired. I just wasn't very active for like the first year or two after transplant. Um, so now I gotta fight to get my weight back down to about the 170 pound mark. Um, it's about 30 pounds. You know, it, it won't be that hard. Uh, I'm determined, so I'll get it done. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm okay with the the transplant part. I'm, I've been down that road. Um, this time we're hoping that I can get my weight back down for two reasons. Uh, you know, uh, one is that you have to be of a certain below a certain weight in order to have the transplant done. The other is because they're hoping to be able to do a um, pancreas kidney transplant dual. Um, I would have had it done last time, but the the kidney that I received came from a donor from California, and the pancreas wouldn't have survived the time out of body. Um, it's roughly eight hours from from harvest to to transplant. Um, possibly a little more. Um, if this is the case, regular kidney transplant, you're in the hospital five to seven days tops. Um, you're eating by like a day, two days later, you know, everything like that. Um, if I have the dual done, um, I'm looking at about 10 to 15 days in the hospital. I'll be on a feeding tube, and, you know, it'll be a lot worse looking than the first transplant. Um, the hardest part about the about losing this kidney, um, it took me about three years to get over the transplant initially. Um, it's if you've ever met a veteran who actually deployed and they lost. Um, fellow soldiers, they suffer from survivor's guilt. You know, or basically fellow soldiers had passed away and they lived. Um, I experienced a level of that being a transplant recipient because um, a 23 year old girl had passed away. Um, when I received the call for that kidney, I was a, uh, it was a perfect six antigen match. It's the, it's the best you can get. Um, when they transplanted me, a lot of times people who are already on dialysis when they're transplanted, they require further dialysis for a few days to, to get that kidney working again. Um, the, um, the kidney took right away. Um, I didn't require any dialysis. My first meeting with the, with the, with the transplant nephrologist, the surgeon, after, after transplant, um, he walked in, he, you know, he shook my hand and basically told me that this kidney could have come from my sister. It was that close. Um, they refer to it as a golden match and it's not something you get very often. Um, honestly, I had a better chance of hitting the Powerball last week for the 1.5 billion than I did, than I do of ever getting that match again. Um, so now it's, there's a little bit of guilt involved with that, you know, because you're, you're tasked with making this work, you know, and keeping it healthy. Um, and I know I do have other risk factors involved, with, you know, being diabetic and the diabetes just attacked it again. And it's basically what happened is it just, you know, it just, it, it the diabetes took over. And, um, you know, 
but it's I don't know. It's it's you you feel guilty and you you can't help that. Um, at some point, you just need to come to grips with it. Um, I I have a fantastic transplant team at the University of Penn in Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Naji was my was my transplant surgeon the first time around. I pray to God that I get him again, because um, there is no better in the world. Um, some people might recognize his name because he's been featured on um, the uh, the Regis and Kelly show when Regis was still on there, obviously. Um, but he's he's an amazing man. Um, I wasn't. I'm not the most religious of people. I mean, I do have a lot of faith. Um, or I should say I wasn't the most religious of people. Um, but experiencing what I experienced, you know, I'm not saying I saw a tunnel or a light or anything like that. It's not what I mean. It's you know, as I was given a gift, and it, it's not a, it's not a gift that just anybody can give you. You know, it's, I'm a, I'm a firm, firm believer, and everything happens for a reason. I'm a firm believer in, in that we aren't giving, given anything that we can't handle. And through through my original transplant, I had I had developed a new relationship with with God, my God. You know, everybody's everybody has their own God and that's fine. You know? But with my God I found a new relationship. And you know my my grandmother tells me, well, she hasn't said it so much lately, but she, when she would know I was, I was like suffering, I guess you could say, um, or, or having a hard time coping, she would tell me that, God doesn't do this to punish us. He does it because he knows we can handle it. Because we're the strong. And I, I firmly believe that. And I know people that that couldn't handle this. They just couldn't. And it's not a slight against anybody. It's really not. It's it's just Some people will be, were born to go and fight bad guys. Others were born to, to fight, you know, just other things. And this is my war. And I've, it, you know, some people ask me what it's like to be diabetic and, or deal with the things that I've dealt with. And every once in a while, I'll come to a bridge that, you know, it, it makes it hard. Um, I wouldn't change anything for the world. I, I wouldn't. I don't regret anything about my life. Um, I would never go back and change the fact that I was born diabetic. I just wouldn't. Because if not me, who? You know, say if, if I'm not the one that, that takes it, somebody else does. Um, but there are points where it's crushing. Um, 
when I was in my early teens and I knew I didn't know any better, my dream was to become a Marine. graduate high school in 1995 and from there I was going to go right into the Marine Corps and then I found out that the, that the military no branch takes juvenile diabetics and it crushed me I felt like I had nowhere to go I was horrible in school I'm not stupid by any means but in school I just I hated school so I thought the military was going to be my way um, then, you know, a couple years went by and I thought about becoming a police officer. And, uh, I was about 27, 28, I guess. And I started investigating on, you know, what I needed to do to become a police officer, where I needed to go. And, Just as I got ready to contact the the police academy here in Montgomery County um, to find out what I needed to do, I lost my vision. So it it's kind of like there comes points where you take all your your dreams and you put them in a paper bag and just light them on fire. But that's what it feels like sometimes. But then, there's other things that make it worth it. You know, it's, it's because of the struggles that I've had with diabetes, I know there's nothing that I can't tackle. You know, there's nothing I can't beat. I'm not afraid of anything. You know, and it's because I've been fighting diabetes all my life. I'm really hoping that that even one person sees these videos and through through my experiences and my life they can see that it's okay. You know, this, this isn't a, it isn't a prison sentence. It's, you know, it's a cross. Everybody's got to cross the bear, and this is just yours. But it doesn't mean you can't live your life. You know, I'm, I'm an avid pool player. I run my own team. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm an avid, firearm shooter, despite being blind in one eye. Um, I, I'm heavily involved with the, with the Second Amendment community. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's nice to go and do things and people know you're visually impaired and they, they see you do it and they're like, wow. You know, and that's kind of cool sometimes, but I don't want to be known as the blind guy. I mean, yeah, it's fun, you know. I make fun of myself. I'll beat you to the punchline before you can even think of it. Um, I ask everybody all the time, is that a blind joke? You know, just, but it takes the, takes the sting out of things. And it makes, it lets people know it's all right. You don't have to walk on that chest without me. You know, I have pretty tough skin. Um, It, uh, but yeah, you know, I just, I just want people to realize that it, that it's okay. You know, it's, you can, you can do it. You can live. You know, it's, it's not a death sentence. It's not. You just have to be willing to fight extra hard. If you're willing if you're willing to put that effort in, you'll get the rewards back. But it takes effort. Nothing, I mean, it's like anything in life. If you're not willing to fight for it, 
it's not worth it. Um, so it's, like I said, it's not a death sentence. Um, if you're not willing to fight for it, you probably shouldn't have it. You know, it's, 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 it's a tough pill to swallow, but there's nothing easy about this. You know, it's, yeah, I want to take days off all the time. You know, there's days I just want to quit, but I can't. I have a family. I have, I have friends. I have a world of people who care about me. And it's my support. You know, I, I can't give up on myself and let them down because giving up on myself lets me down in the end. I mean, it's, I'm worth more than that. Yeah. Um, when I was young and I was put, I was put into a, a child guidance clinic for 30 days because of my health. Um, while I was there, I had a very good therapist. I can't remember her last name, but her first name was Carol. You know, I remember that was 20 some years ago. Um, and she told me to always remember that diabetes doesn't have me. I have diabetes. So, um, I said I would explain the hat to you. Um, last time I was, I was going through kidney failure, um, the toxins build up in your body. They need somewhere to go. Um, when they start finding the places to go, it usually forms as some type of acne, it looks like, but it's not. Um, they're almost like pus nodules. Um, the last time it happened, it was in my entire right arm. I get them all over the place. They're painful. They're disgusting looking. Um, I started to notice it on my forehead. So, hence the hat. Um, I'm a hat person anyway. <laughs> I like hats, uh, although ever since I started shaving my head, I haven't worn them as much. Um, my dog, who have you seen popping in the picture every once in a while, he is a therapy dog. Um, when he notices stress or, or he notices me being upset, he wants to be near me. Um, so he noticed, he knows, even if I try to hide the tears, he knows I'm crying. Um, he can also hear it in my voice. Um, you probably heard him whine a little bit, that's, that's why. Um, so typically whenever you see me, <laughs> my dog's pretty close. Um, to be quite honest, um, There's a lot of this. I don't know if I'd be able to do without him. <laughs> He's staring at me now. <laughs> um, He's always been there for me. I mean, always. This dog, as long as I let him, he won't leave my side. <laughs> um, <laughs> here he comes. <laughs> Um, the most amazing part about this dog is I literally got him for a bag of dog food. He was part of a of a mistake litter. The girl thought there was going to be 16 puppies, so she was she was struggling. <laughs> she was struggling to find homes for them all, and. She was a friend of my, my ex, um, and I, had, I was working for a, a well-known shelter at the time, and we would get food donations. And um, she had told me, when I told her that I would like to take one of the puppies, how much did she want? She said, just a bag of dog food. And what particular brand and what size is possible. I said, okay, not a problem. Um, one day we got a donation in, 
and it was that particular brand of dog food never opened but the bag was expired um, we weren't allowed to use expired dog food in the kennels which is acceptable you know even though dog food lasts for God knows how long um, so rather than throw that bag out I grabbed it I took it up to her and she let me pick this guy out he's the only one in his litter that looks like him um, he is German Shepherd, Rottweiler, Anatolian Mastiff mix, which is, or Anatolian Shepherd, I'm sorry, which is a Mastiff. Um, and I think he's part border collie, to tell you the truth. Um, the part that scares me the most about him is he is a large breed. Um, he weighs about 100, 105 pounds right now, but he's going to be 10 years old. He was born on my birthday, um, but he's going to be 10 years old. Fortunately, he's got a lot of life in him. He's very playful. Um, but his age scares the death out of me. His... I, I need him here. People... People tell me I'm their rock. But he's mine. I know whenever I need him, he's he's there for me. I'm conditional. I could yell at him all I want to, and he don't care. All he wants to do is lick me. <laughs> and trust me, you don't want to be licked by him for the rest of But, but, you know, now that I went off on, on a tangent, um, I just wanted to update everybody on the news that I had gotten. It's bad, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's... I knew this wasn't going to be an easy fight. I knew it the first time. Um, and this fight's never going to end. But I choose not to let it define me. I choose not to let it stop me. People tend to not want to take a chance on me, and that's fine. You don't have to, because somebody will. And when that person does, or those people do, they'll find out just how much of a fighter and just how loyal I really am. I'm loyal to a fault. Um, I don't quit until the job is done and done right. That's the way I was raised. Um, thank you, Dad. <laughs> you know, she and my grandmother, who I'm very close to, she instilled that in me. Um, yeah, just please, when you watch these videos, don't feel sorry for me. It's the worst thing you could do, is feel sorry for me. Because it's not what I want. I want people to understand. And people to know that it's okay. A little fight never hurt anybody. It just makes you stronger in the end. Yeah. And there's, there's two people that I know who are part of my inspiration. Um, one of them being my Uncle Joey. Um, he, was, he was born with um, mild cerebral palsy, but he is one of the smartest, most successful men I know today. Um, one of the best welders you'll ever meet. Um, and then there, there's a little boy that we know that we 
we've we in the in the the firearms community we've adopted as our our nephew we call him sniper seth um he's 10 or 11 i'm not i'm not sure exactly of his age um he's a wonderful kid um he's battled lymphoma three times now um i'm not sure if he's still currently in treatment um but he's he's a fighter and to be around him you'd never know and seeing that helps me you know so it's 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 okay to look to other people for help for for inspiration it's you know, it doesn't matter who it doesn't matter what they're fighting it just you it's, it's okay to get inspiration in your life you know and, but yeah so like I said <laughs> just uh just want to update everybody um it's gonna be a long road um but I know I got people with me for the ride so you know. we uh I'll definitely keep everyone updated on progress um any drastic changes or you know anything like that I'll uh, I'll keep you I'll keep you posted <laughs> um, and you know to everybody on a personal on a personal level any of my close friends or anybody on my anybody who knows me on Facebook who knows what I'm currently battling who've supported me and wished me well and are praying for me um thank you you know it's 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 good to know that there are people out there pulling for you so just uh don't feel sorry again please don't feel sorry if you want to do something Keep me in your thoughts and not in your prayers. So, my family as well. You know, they struggle with this more than I do. <laughs> um, especially my wife, considering her most recent videos made it out. Um, she ain't getting rid of me this easily. <laughs> it just won't happen. So, but everybody, you know, enjoy your time. Uh, Valentine's Day is coming up in, I guess, a couple weeks. Um, if you're out here on the East Coast, batting down the hatches, we're in for a possibly, you know, a drastic snowstorm this weekend. Um, you know, so I hope you got your 45 loaves of bread and your 55 gallons of milk. Don't forget the eight dozen eggs. Um, what you're gonna do with that stuff if the power goes out, I don't know, but whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes joking is all you got. Laughter is the best medicine. So keep laughing, keep smiling. Live every day like it's your last. I'll see you around.